Welcome to Mariners. We are so glad that you're joining our online community and we worship together in celebration of all that God has done in the lives of his people this past weekend. We had over 265 people say, I believe to Jesus, and we had 93 people get baptized. We also worship in expectancy of what God will continue to do. So would you join us as we worship and let's sing together. Praise. 
lift it up together. Oh, praise. Say, oh, praise the name. joining us in worship today. My name is Pamela and I'm your online connections pastor and I'm so glad that you are a part of our online gatherings. If you're in the Orange County area though and you haven't joined us in person yet, I want to invite you to come and be a part of our live services at our locations in Irvine and Huntington Beach and our smaller neighborhood gatherings because there's so much joy in worshiping together and hearing God's word in community. 
Whenever you're ready, join us in person and continue to be a part of what God is doing through our weekend gatherings. You can find all location and service times on our website or through our Mariners app. I'm so excited to share an opportunity for you as our online congregation called Mariners Hosted Here. As you join us locally, nationally, or even globally, Mariners Hosted Here equips you to invite others and host our weekly services so that you can be the church wherever you are. Through on-demand service links, kid resources, and weekly service guides, and ongoing host trainings, we would love to partner with you through this beautiful expression of the church. You can find more on our website by searching for Hosted Here. I'm also really excited for our new series launching next week as we go through the book of 1 Peter. We're not gonna be skipping a verse, so we hope that you don't skip a week. Thank you so much for being here with us, and I pray that God speaks to you profoundly through today's message. Well, hey there, Mariners fam. What an honor and privilege it is to hang out with you guys this Independence Day weekend. And uh, it is so cool to be living in a country where we get to experience freedoms that were won for us by people who fought for us. And uh, that relates to the gospel as well. I hope and pray that this Independence Day weekend, you'd feel a depth of freedom deep in your soul because of the battle that Jesus fought and the battle that Jesus won. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with me, my name is Dan Leanne. I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. That's the reason my voice is this way. Uh, my mother and father are Malaysian Chinese. That's the reason my beautiful face is this way. But now I live in Anderson, South Carolina, where I get to serve as a teaching pastor at a church called New Spring Church. We have 14 campuses across the state of South Carolina. So if you're ever in town, drop in, say hello. You are family. Well, in a few minutes today, I just want to unpackage a concept or a thought that I hope and pray is going to bring deep encouragement and hope to your soul. I want to talk about storms today. In particular, and in particular, I want to talk about the kinds of storms we all go through where it feels like God goes uneasingly quiet. In fact, there are times where it feels like God goes silent in our storm. There are some storms in life where, where our lives get rocked, um, our world is shaken, and we turn to God and instantaneously He reacts and He responds in encouragement, a word, a provision, some protection. There are times where, where everything gets a little rocky, but God moves really quickly. But there are other times in the journey where the cloud gathers, the storm brews, and it hits. Our lives are shaken, our worlds are rocked, and we cry out to God. And we know He's good, and we know that He's strong, but for some reason, there are some kinds of storms that we go through where it feels like He goes uneasingly quiet, silent in our storm. And it's important for us, there are certain imperative for us as a faith community to process through where he is in the silence because no one likes silence from God. Silence is distressing. Silence is disturbing. And silence not biblically and correctly processed through becomes destructive to our faith journey. But here's the good news. Our Jesus doesn't want to see your life or your faith destroyed, but he wants to see you built up and strengthened. That's the reason He gives us the Word of God and the Spirit of God to help us process through these seasons we will all go through at some point in our journey. Where is Jesus when it feels like He's gone silent in our storm? So that's what we're going to look at for a couple of minutes. And I'm believing in faith that, that basically at the end of this talk, there are going to be a whole bunch of people who are going to be left incredibly encouraged, incredibly empowered. In fact, there are some people who are going to step into brand new life. I remember a storm that my wife and I went through a couple of years ago where it felt like God went uneasingly quiet. Uh, it came in the form of our firstborn child, Caitlin. Uh, when she came along, I was pretty confident. Even though I was a new dad, I was a youth communicator. She was a young person. I thought we were going to get each other. I read a book. I thought I did everything one could do to prepare themselves for the rigors of child rearing. And sure enough, for the first six months, it was very, very easy. She slept well, she ate well, she even smiled for pictures. I thought I should be writing a book. Then something started happening after six months that didn't stop happening for two years. At 8 a.m., 8, 8 p.m., and then at 10 p.m., and then 1 a.m., and then at 3 a.m., and then 5 a.m., my baby girl would rise up out of her slumber and begin to cry. I'm not talking about cute baby tears that make you want to take a picture for all posterity. I'm talking about blood-curling screams that make you want to throw holy water on her and see if something flies out. 
And so my wife and I found ourselves every single night sitting on this black couch in our little house, crying wife, crying baby, immediately crying, but not crying because I'm a manly man, asking this question, hey, Jesus, where are you in this storm? Sleep deprivation, the pain of feeling like a failure as a parent, everyone trying to help, everyone offering advice, nothing actually helping us forward. We felt in this situation that God had gone incredibly quiet in our storm. So I did everything that a good Christian soldier does. Uh, I started praying to God. You know, those crazy prayers in the middle of the night, those theologically incorrect prayers. Hey God, I'm gonna mortgage my soul to you. I'll serve you the rest of my days for nothing. Just help my baby go to sleep one night, but night after night in the same spot, crying wife, crying baby, and me nearly crying, but not crying because I'm a manly man, feeling like God was being silent in our storm. I thought if our prayer wasn't gonna work, then we're gonna bring the word of God into this. So I pull out a Bible and I find a concordance and I find every single reference uh, to verses that have the words stillness, peace, silence, shut up. And I'm speaking it over my little baby girl. I'm rubbing the Bible on her head. But night after night, this unrelenting storm would not back off. The pain was so real and we felt like God was silent in our storm. I thought if the prayer and the word wasn't going to do it, we'd bring some Christian TV into it. So I turned the Christian TV on and, and now Joyce Meyer is preaching. I'm rubbing the Bible on her head. I'm praying these crazy prayers, but silence in the storm. If Joyce wasn't going to sort it out, I'm going to bring the real big guns into it. I'm going to bring Darlene check into it. So I've got some worship music going. So she's shouting unto the Lord. Joyce is preaching. I'm rubbing the Bible on her head. I'm praying these crazy prayers, but this particular storm would not relent. Night after night, finding ourselves in the exact same spot, feeling like God had gone uneasingly quiet, like someone had bumped a mute button in heaven and we'd been forgotten. Have you ever felt that way before? And I know that being a part of a faith community, people are trying to help. And, and I've got this great advice coming from all different, uh, different places about how to get my baby to go to sleep. I had this beautiful old Asian lady come and tell me what I needed to do was to get some boiling tea and to pour it on my daughter's back. And what would happen is her hair would grow out. I need to shave that hair off and my baby girl would go to sleep. And so I, here I am in the middle of the night, I'm boiling this kettle. I'm praying these crazy prayers. I'm claiming these verses. I'm watching Christian TV. I'm listening to worship music, but nothing would cause this storm to relent night after night, silence in our storm. And here's the reality. I know there are many people watching right now who don't know what it's like to feel the pain of sleep deprivation or feel like a failure as the parent of an infant. But I know that everyone watching right now knows what it's like to go through a storm where you know God is good, you know that He's strong, but you don't feel his goodness or his strength in that moment. And it causes you to ask questions in the quiet of your soul. Where are you, Jesus, when you're being so quiet in our storm? I know there are people who are going through like financial or business storms right now. This last year has been difficult on all of us and for many finances, you know, they've been rocked and, and, and you aren't back yet. And, and what makes it really difficult is you're seeing everyone around you getting on their feet again and things are up and to the right again. But for you, it feels like God's gone quiet in your financial storm. You're doing everything right by the book. You're giving, you're sowing, you're tithing, you're claiming him as Jehovah, clap, my Jira, my provider. You're doing everything right, but for some reason, you keep going backwards. And you ask this question quietly, hey Jesus, do you care about our financial situation? Because it feels like you've gone quiet in this storm. Uh, how about those family storms? Uh, they're called teenagers. Remember back in the day when they were so cute and sweet and innocent and, and the Bible told you that if you raise them a certain way, they, they wouldn't depart from these paths, but not only are they departing from these paths, they're running away at a rate of knots and you're asking this question deep in your soul. You're not broadcasting it out loud, but you want to know, hey God, do you care about my teenager? My son, my daughter, that prodigal that's running away, do you have your eyes on him or her? I see my friends around me and they're doing so great in their families, but it feels like our family is breaking at the seams. Hey, Jesus, why are you being so quiet in the middle of this storm? How about that marriage storm that you may be going through right now? 2020 exposed a lot of things and 
I know for a lot of people that I journey with, it exposed some real issues within their marriage. And it's been really difficult for you to see other friends of yours find some healing and some restoration and some revelation regarding their marriage. But for you, it feels like you are further apart now than at the, than at the beginning of the pandemic. And you're asking this question, hey, Jesus, why would you heal my marriage? Why would you turn his heart? Why would you heal her heart? Why would you do something for us? Do you not care? Do you not see? Why are you being so quiet in the middle of this storm? How about that health storm? That sickness, that ailment, that disease, that disability. You hear all the time that God is Jehovah Rapha, the God who delights in healing. He's the great physician of the universe. And you've seen the testimonies. You've heard the stories of the cancers that have shrunk, the, the, the parts of the body that have come alive again, the eyes that have been opened. But you ask this question, where's my story? Where's my testimony? I would love to be a great example of God moving in somebody's being, but I haven't seen my story yet. Hey, Jesus, why are you being so quiet in the middle of this health storm that I've got? The reality is all of us as human beings are knit together by this common thread. At some point in our journey, we're going to ask this question of our good and great God. Where is your goodness and your greatness now? Come on, let's be real right now. We've all asked it at some point in the last 14 months. And this silence is distressing. This silence has been disturbing. And for many people, this silence, because it hasn't been processed through correctly, has been destructive. But here I am, I'm here to declare to you that God not only wants to help you understand where He is when it feels like He's gone quiet in your storm, but He wants to give you faith tools. He wants to give you equipment to journey through these seasons. And so what I want to do in my remaining minutes with you is I want to turn to the Word of God and I want to have a look at a passage in the Gospels where Jesus went uneasingly quiet in His disciples' storm. And I want to make some observations and I want to turn these, faith, uh, these observations into faith declarations regarding not only where Jesus was, but where He is when it feels like He's gone just a little quiet in your storm. The passage is found in the book of Mark. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Mark chapter 4. Come on, in your living room right now, just say Mark, like an Australian, Mark. Say like an American, Mark. I love it. Say it in Chinese, Mark. I, I, I taught you languages. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And the Bible says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. <sighs> the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you still so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I love this text because I see myself in this text. I'm just a disciple trying to get from point A through to point B and stay close to Jesus. But sometimes life dishes up a storm. I want you to recognize that right away that the disciples were commanded to get into the boat, to go to the other side where they met a storm. They were smack bang, if you will, in the middle of God's will. We need to break this paganistic, erroneous thinking that says, if something is going wrong in your life, if you're facing a storm, it means that you've done something wrong. Sometimes good stuff, bad stuff happens to good people. And here they are, just like me. I'm just trying to get from point A through to point B. And this furious squall hits their boat. And they're rocked and they're tossed and they're turned and they're driven to ask this question. Hey, Jesus, do you care if we drown? Because the whole way through this episode, it feels like you're relatively disconnected from our plight. It seems like on the surface, you're relatively apathetic to our pain. Teacher, do you care if we drown? I've asked that question before. You have to. Teacher, do you care about my pain? Teacher, do you care about this wound? Teacher, do you care about this relationship? Teacher, do you care about my bank account? Teacher, do you care about my business? Teacher, do you care about my kids? Teacher, do you care about 
this sickness? Do you care if we drown? Jesus wakes up, turns to the wind and the waves and says, quiet, be still. Creation is calmed. Peace is restored, but more about that later. I want to ask this question. Where was Jesus? No. Where is Jesus when it feels like he's gone quiet in our storm? I'm so glad that you're catching this online right now. So if you're watching this online right now, I would love you to pull out a, a pen and some paper and to scribble some notes down. If you have an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad, if you have you know, some kind of you know, Blackberry or Google device, pull it out right now, fi find a note app, because I promise you these revelations are gonna help you navigate these seasons where it feels like he's gone quiet in your storm. Point number one, where is Jesus when it feels like he's gone quiet in our storm? Number one, he's still in your boat. He is still in your boat. You'll see there, there in that passage, it says, they took Jesus along just as he was in the boat. He had not left them. He had not forsaken them. When the going got hot, Jesus didn't get going. He promised to be with them to the very end of this age. And the great promise maker was being a grand promise keeper. In that moment, Jesus was still in the boat. He hasn't left you. He hasn't forsaken you. The going may be getting hot, but Jesus hasn't got going. He is still in your boat. As the rain drenched the disciples, the rain was drenching Jesus. As the waves were tossing the disciples, <laughs> the waves were tossing Jesus. If that boat capsized and the disciples would have to make a swim for shore, Jesus too would have capsized and he would have to make a swim slash walk for sure. Why? Because Jesus was still in the boat. That's what captured my heart when I was 17 years old, <laughs> so many decades ago, regarding gos the gospel and King Jesus. Up to that point, I, I consider myself a relatively religious individual, raised with a different kind of tradition around me and my family. But, but, but I had always kind of pondered, you know, God and, and the creator. And I always thought that all religions were basically the same. And then I was to discover at age 17 that Christianity stands alone, that Christianity is unique, that Christianity is different because every other world religion is about living your life in such a way so that you can impress God so that he would remove you from your pain and your problems. Whereas the gospel and Christianity declares a God that is so good that he would come to earth to get into our boat, into the middle of the storm and not leave. In your household, he's still in your boat. Sitting at the dinner table, looking at your bills, trying to make ends meet, he's still in your boat. In the middle of a relational breakdown and tensions with your friendships, he's still in your boat. Not knowing where to from here and whether or not you'll ever get back on your feet again like you were on your feet at the start of 2020, he's still in your boat. lying in a hospital bed, going through your treatment. He's still in your boat. If you walk away with nothing else out of our online gathering today, I hope and pray that you walk away with this. No matter how dark the night, no matter how deep the hole, no matter how unrelenting the storm, he is still in your boat. Point number two, write this down. Not only is he still in your boat, he's still in control. Jesus is still in control. Now you might ask the question, Dan, how can you say he's still in control? It felt like he was totally out of control. These poor disciples were hanging on for dear life. But I would propose to you that Jesus didn't sleep because he didn't care. Jesus didn't sleep because he was disconnected from his disciples' plight. Jesus slept because he wasn't stressed. Why? because he was still in control. If the disciples had paid closer attention, the disciples would have heard the outcome to this story right at the beginning of this story, when Jesus declared, let us go over to the other side. Jesus didn't say, hey, today looks like a nice day to go into the middle of the lake to drown. Jesus said, we're getting to the other side. 
And the care and the love and the concern of Jesus was proven once and for all on a bloodstained cross. That's the reason the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter five and verse eight. But God would demonstrate his love for us in this, that whilst we're, still, whilst we're sinners, Jesus Christ still died for us. Or in other words, he proved to us once and for all how he feels about us by carrying a cross up a lonely hill to suffer and die so that we could live, so that we could know forevermore that we are loved and we are cared for. So we must conclude that if he didn't sleep because he didn't care, he slept for another reason. And I would suggest he slept on that cushion because he wasn't stressed. He's still in control. That's what Colossians chapter one tells us. This is Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. That's his theological talk for. He's the boss of the universe in whom everything was made, for whom everything was made, in whom everything is held together. He's literally got the whole world in his hands and he was holding that boat together with his hands. He was holding their lives together with his hands. Because of Jesus, his person and his presence, every ion, every element, every fabric in the universe is held together. Without Jesus, everything Everything would discombobulate and blow apart. But because of Jesus and his goodness and his faithfulness, you can declare right now, no matter what storm you're in, he is still in control. And how do you get stressed out by a storm when you invented it? How does rain freak you out when you thought it up? How does a sea of Galilee rob you of your peace <laughs> when you made it? Jesus didn't sleep because he didn't care. Jesus isn't silent because he's not concerned. He was silent and he slept because he was still in control. And I want you to receive that right now, wherever you're catching this. Maybe in your living room or you're watching this uh, while you're stuck in traffic on the way into LA. Uh, you might be catching this, you know, on some vacation time. I want you to get this right now especially when it feels like everything is falling apart. You gotta understand, he hasn't slipped, he hasn't lost grip, he is still in control. So he's still in your boat, he's still in control, and point number three, he is still up to something good. Man, I love the way that this story comes to a conclusion. The disciples are freaking. They're saying the final goodbyes. No one's trying to wake up Jesus because the day before they saw Jesus raise someone from the dead and they just concluded that if he could raise someone from the dead, he could probably do the opposite to us. And so, so they're not trying to mess with Jesus' sleep, but finally it gets to a point where they couldn't hold it in and they had to wake Jesus up. I would have loved to seen the conversation leading up to that point. Hey, Peter, you should say something. You're always shooting off your mouth. Say something. And then Peter's saying, you know what? He called me Satan last week. I don't really want to push it. Hey, Thomas, you should say something. And Thomas replying, I doubt he'll listen to me. Hey, Judas, you should say something. And Judas saying, you know what? He always looks at me weird. I don't know what conversation went on, but eventually Jesus is awoken. He turns to the wind and he turns to the waves. And with a word, he says, quiet, be still. And creation is calm. The most powerful force that would rob them of their peace was settled down in an instant with just the word. Don't ever allow a season of silence to rob you of your revelation that our Jesus is just as big and just as strong as he has ever been. Don't ever allow a season where it feels like he's gone quiet to, to, to let you forget that our God is just as big and just as powerful as he has ever been. Can I take you to Sunday school for 30 seconds? Come on, this is Jesus and he's got the might to create the heavens and the earth in six days and still give us one full day off to watch college football. This is our Jesus. He could bring forth the nation of Israel from a pensioner and his barren wife. Come on, this is our Jesus. He could split a Red Sea with nothing but a stick and a gust of wind. This is our Jesus. He can bring down the walls of Jericho with nothing but a song and a shout. This is our Jesus. He can fell the giant Goliath with nothing but a sling and a stone. This is Jesus. He's strong enough to close the mouth of the lion, open the eyes of the blind, heal the sick, raise the dead, birth the church. He was strong enough to save this crazy life. And he's just as strong as he has ever been. And he is right now up to something good. And we know that because at the end of this story, the disciples are kind of conveying together, convening together and saying, hey, who is this Jesus guy? Even the wind and the waves, they obey him. 
Or in other words, before the start of this season of silence, we didn't know this about Jesus, but now at the end of this season of silence, we know so much more about Him. And because God is more interested in the faith that is growing, the man and woman that you're becoming, the trust that is developing right there in your heart, even right now in this season, He will allow us to go through governed seasons of silence where He's still in the boat, where He's still in control because He knows that something is growing that is so good that couldn't grow in any other environment. It's easy to sing about amazing grace when everything is going well, but you just wait till you find yourself in amongst a territory of rubble. Amazing grace goes from a hymn you sing to actually being him in the midst of what you're going through. Hey, hey, it's easy to talk about God being your provider. Hey, when everything is up and to the right, when, when, your, uh, when your bonds are overflowing and your, and your bank account is looking good, but you just wait till you need Him to really move on your behalf in the area of your finances. It goes from a theology that you believe to a truth that you really hold to. God is doing something good right now in this season that he could not accomplish in any other environment. He is still in your boat. He is still in control. And right now, even when it doesn't feel like it, he's still up to something good. And I hope and pray that as you continue to journey forward, maybe experiencing a season where it feels like he's gone quiet in your storm, that you would know that deep within your being, that he is still in control. He's still in your boat, still in control, and he's still up to something good. And your faith would not be destroyed, but your faith would be enriched as you hold on to these faith declarations in the midst of your storm. I wish I could finish this talk with a you know, with a faith building miracle story. And I wish I could tell you that my little baby girl, all those years ago, after this crazy silence in the storm, you know, went to sleep after an angel broke into my house one night, like tore the ceiling open, jumped into our, lo- into our living room, put a coal in my daughter's mouth and said, hey, you know what? Um, you're gonna preach the gospel around the world. That's the reason you can't be quiet right now. But that didn't happen. My little baby girl, she went to sleep after a couple of years because she got tired. But fear not, my wife and I were smart enough to make another one to pick up exactly where his sister left off. And so here we are again, crying wife, crying baby boy, and me still nearly crying, but not crying because I'm a manly man, praying these prayers, feeling like God is silent in our storm. I remember one night we're in our living room and my wife just exhausted, but still looking so beautiful. She turns to me, she says, hey, babe, we're going to be okay. Because Jesus is still in our boat. And I told her, babe, I know that. Because I taught you that. Now, <laughs> that the story may not have gone exactly that way. But I can declare that in the Leanne household, the next storm that we faced, where it felt like God was uneasingly quiet, we faced it with a different faith and a different knowing, knowing He's still in our boat, He's still in control, and He is still up to something good. So right now, would you allow me to pray with you? If you've gone through or if you're going through a season of silence, I'm going to believe with you, knit faith with you that you're going to see a breakthrough, protection and provision. But before that, I want to pray that you know him so present in your boat in the middle of your storm. Would you just knit faith with me right now? In the name of Jesus, we come to you. 
And I pray for my friends right now who are going through a season of silence in a storm. Let them know you're still in their boat, you're still in control, and you're still up to something good. In Jesus' name, amen.
hey, would you allow me just to speak a blessing over you? Uh, just like in anything in life, uh, when you're receiving something, you just kind of you open up your hands towards it. And so would you in faith, if you feel comfortable, wherever you are, just open up your hands as an act of surrender and reception. If, if you're driving a car right now, you know what I'm saying, you know, just open the fingers up, don't take your hands off the steering wheel. But I just want to speak a blessing over you right now. In the name of Jesus, through the love of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit, I speak a blessing over my friends. Would you fill their hearts with your peace, their minds with your thoughts, their feet with your purpose and direction. May they know your presence today. May they know the wind of heaven behind them, blowing them into every good In Jesus' name, amen.